In our headlines on this Thursday, December 5th, here in South Korea. Opposition lawmakers have submitted a motion to impeach President Yoon suk yeol over the stunning but short-lived imposition of martial law. And Korea's ambassador to Saudi Arabia and also a retired four-star general, Choi Pyeonghyuk, has been tapped to lead the country's defense ministry. Meanwhile, the economy rebounded 0.1% on quarter during the July to September period, but it fell short of the BOK's earlier expectations. We start at the National Assembly, where formal proceedings seeking a presidential impeachment have been put into motion, with a parliamentary vote on the matter to take place within this week. Our correspondent Shin Haiyang has the latest. A motion to impeach President Yoon suk yeol over his short-lived martial law declaration proposed by the six opposition parties, including the Democratic Party, was reported to the National Assembly during Thursday's plenary session with the ruling People Power Party not in attendance. The impeachment motion against President Yoon accuses him of disrupting constitutional order by suspending the National Assembly's functions and violating political freedoms by banning party activities. This marks the third impeachment motion against a sitting president in South Korea's constitutional history. Under the National Assembly Act, the motion must be reported in the first plenary session after its proposal, and the vote must take place between 24 and 72 hours after that. A vote on the motion can take place as early as 12.49 a.m. on Friday. According to the National Assembly Act, to pass, the motion needs the support of two-thirds of the National Assembly or 200 votes. With the opposition holding 192 seats, at least eight PPP members would need to support it for it to move to the Constitutional Court. If it passes, President Yoon will be suspended from his duties immediately. Shin Ayong, Arirang News. Speaking of duty suspension, the opposition-led parliament on this Thursday voted in favor of the impeachments of four officials, including the head of the National Audit Organization. Our correspondent Yi shi reports. On Thursday, the opposition members of the National Assembly, led by the main opposition Democratic Party of Korea, approved motions to impeach the heads of South Korea's Board of Audit and Inspection and the Seoul Central District Prosecutor's Office and two more prosecutors for their alleged misuse of power in conducting purposefully insufficient investigations of allegations surrounding President Yoon suk yeol and the First Lady Kim gon hee marking the parliament's first-ever impeachment of the nation's main audit chief. All those accused, the Board of Audit Chief Choi Jae-hae, SCDPO Chief Lee chang soo and Seoul's prosecutors Cho Sang-won and Choi Jae-hoon, are immediately suspended from duties. Of the 192 lawmakers present for the vote, an overwhelming majority voted in favor of the dismissal of all respective officials. The most approvals at 188 for the audit chief Choi, who took charge of inspecting President Yoon's unprecedented office relocation from the previous Cheongwade, or the Blue House, to a new location in Yongsangu District in central Seoul. The others investigated First Lady Kim's stock price manipulation allegations, which concluded with no indictment. The ruling People Power Party opted out of voting and held a protest rally instead, calling the motion a shameless move by the DP to disturb government affairs. Following the impeachment, a strong and immediate backlash from the prosecution. The SCDPO released a statement and said there are no constitutional grounds to do so. It said the prosecutors carried out their investigations based on the law and evidence and that this wrong example of impeachment will disturb their operations, which serve the people. The Supreme Prosecutor's Office, too, has previously denounced such a push for impeachment, saying that the National Assembly should not abuse its power for political purposes. Now, it is up to the Constitutional Court of Korea to review the motion and make the final decision on whether to dismiss or return the four officials to duty. The key will be whether the audit body and the prosecution's investigations were unlawful. The process is expected to take months. Yi shi Arirang News. Meanwhile, at a parliamentary hearing earlier on this Thursday, Vice Defense Minister Kim Son ho fielded some tough questions from lawmakers about the deployment of armed soldiers to the National Assembly upon the President's declaration of martial law. Our correspondent Kim bo has more. 
Former Defense Minister Kim Jong-hyun ordered troops to enter the National Assembly, said Vice Defense Minister Kim sun ho on Thursday. This remark was made in response to a lawmaker's question during a plenary session that was urgently held on the turmoil triggered by President Yoon se yeols aborted declaration of martial law late Tuesday. While saying he feels devastated and sad for not having been able to prevent a series of events from happening in advance, the vice defense minister added that he did not agree with the declaration of martial law nor when mobilizing the military. I fundamentally oppose the mobilization of military forces for martial law and expressed a negative opinion about it. When asked who wrote the martial law decree, he said it was not from the defense ministry. I cannot confirm who drafted it, but one thing I can say is that, based on what I've verified so far, it was not drafted by the defense ministry. Army Chief of Staff General Park a n s u who was named the martial law commander, was also present, and he said he learned about the declaration after seeing President Yoon's televised announcement and the fact that he was named martial law commander during a meeting of key military commanders. After the commander's meeting at the Joint Chiefs of Staff Command Center, the defense minister told me that I was a martial law commander. That is when I knew. I was indeed unaware of the details, such as the process and the movement of the troops. Regarding the martial law decree, General Park said he had suggested a legal review of it before announcing it to the public. But the former defense chief reportedly told him that it had already been done. President Yoon named a new defense minister on Thursday morning after accepting the resignation of the outgoing Kim, who claimed responsibility for the martial law declaration. Former ambassador to Saudi Arabia Choi Byung-hyuk, who the presidential office called the right candidate based on his extensive experience and expertise in defense, was chosen to head the ministry. Kim Bo-kyung, Arirang News. And while the presidential office has yet to address the local media about the dramatic events that unfolded during late Tuesday night and early Wednesday morning, the top office did share its stance with the foreign media. Our An Sung Jin covers that stance. President Yoon Seok-yeol and the presidential office haven't yet released an official statement following the declaration and ending of the martial law decree. However, the South Korean presidential office has claimed through foreign media outlets that the president's declaration of martial law did not violate the constitution. A spokesperson for President Yoon Seok-yeol's office told Reuters that the martial law decree was done in accordance with the constitution and was necessary to protect democracy. The statement seems to come as foreign media pressed for an explanation regarding the president's abrupt attempt to declare martial law. The presidential office further explained that the decision comes as an inevitable response following the opposition party's attempt for impeachment of head figures, including the heads of the Board of Audit and Inspection and the Seoul Central District Prosecutor's Office, and its unilateral handling of budget regulations as mentioned during President Yoon's speech as he declared martial law. The explanation to the foreign press also reportedly mentioned that the declaration of martial law came late at night on Tuesday to minimize any effect on the economy and lives of ordinary citizens. And that martial law troops were deployed to the National Assembly an hour after the speech. An Sung Jin, Arirang News. Meanwhile, U.S. officials within the State Department and the White House are questioning the wisdom of the Yun administration's earlier declaration of martial law, while reaffirming that they had been left in the dark. Our foreign affairs correspondent Pei Yunji reports. Following this week's declaration of martial law, a senior U.S. official has issued a rare criticism of a South Korean leader. U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Kurt Campbell said President Yoon Suk Yeol quote badly misjudged his decision to declare martial law. He also said the move had been seen as deeply problematic and illegitimate when asked to comment on the situation in South Korea at an event organized by the Aspen Strategy Forum on Wednesday. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan also addressed the matter, saying that Washington will continue to speak out publicly to strengthen the importance of South Korea's democracy. He also told a Washington think tank that the United States learned about it on television the same way the rest of the world did, implying that the country was caught unaware by its key ally. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Washington will continue to look to South Korea to set an example as one of the world's most powerful stories about democratic resilience while speaking at a press meeting in Brussels on Wednesday. 
But again, I think uh, Korea is one of the most powerful stories in the world about the emergence of democracy and democratic resilience. Uh, and we'll continue to look to Korea to, shet, to set that example. When asked about the criticism from the U.S., South Korea's foreign ministry simply said it's currently engaging in communication at all levels with the American government. The ministry added that it has sent letters to all embassies in Seoul, requesting them not to raise their travel warnings for South Korea. A foreign ministry spokesperson said the letters included the information that martial law has been lifted in accordance with democratic procedures and that public safety and order were being maintained. They also explained that the country's economy remains solid and that the security situation is also stable, as no unusual movements have been detected in North Korea. There have been no changes in our daily lives and there has been no impact on tourism or economic activities. So we have asked the embassies to report to their home countries that actions such as making adjustments to travel advisories for South Korea do not need to be taken. This comes after the U.S. Embassy in Seoul issued an emergency alert to American citizens in Korea, saying they should avoid areas where protests are taking place. And New Zealand raised its travel advisory from level 1 to level 2 in its four-tier system. The U.K. Foreign Ministry also warned that those in South Korea should avoid large public gatherings, noting that demonstrations are expected in areas around Gwangamun, the presidential office in Samgakji, and the National Assembly in Yeoido. Peun's Arirang News. In other news, a landmark defense agreement between Pyongyang and Moscow, signed by their leaders back in June, went into effect on Wednesday. Our correspondent Kim Jong Shil covers this event and more. The Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Treaty was finalized on Wednesday after Moscow and Pyongyang exchanged ratifications in the Russian capital. North Korea's Vice Foreign Minister Kim jong yu and Russia's Deputy Foreign Minister Andrei Rudenko signed the exchange protocol. The new agreement includes a mutual defense clause obligating either side to provide military support if the other is at war. The treaty is seen as a fighter for regime security, economic growth and public welfare. A unification ministry official noted the treaty's swift enactment, saying it was finalized within a month, unlike the three-month process for the 2000 agreement. The official added that Seoul is monitoring whether North Korea will use it to justify troop deployments to Russia. In October, the North deployed around 11,000 troops to assist Russia with its war in Ukraine, an action experts believe aligns with the new treaty. Meanwhile, regarding concerns from some U.S. experts that North Korea might exploit the turmoil in the South following the declaration of martial law, Professor Im Il-chul said this. North Korea views inter-Korean ties as a hostile two-state relationship, focusing instead on Ukraine and domestic economic issues uh, uh, making it unlikely to exploit the South's position. Pyongyang has yet to report on South Korea's recent declaration and then lifting of martial law on unusual silence given its state newspaper, the Rodong Shinmun, has covered South Korea's anti-government protests almost daily since mid-November. The unification ministry official suggested this quiet approach may reflect caution, similar to North Korea's restrained response during the 2016 protests and impeachment of then-President Park Geun-hye. The official added that Pyongyang likely understands direct involvement in South Korea's situation isn't practical or feasible. Kim Jong-sil, Anirang News. Korea's economy marked an on-quarter rebound in the third quarter of this year, but the expansion fell short of the central bank's expectations. Our correspondent Moon hye has the latest numbers. South Korea's economic growth in the third quarter of the year fell short of earlier forecasts on the back of weaker exports. Data released by the Bank of Korea on Thursday showed that the country's GDP grew by a modest 0.1 percent between July and September this year compared to the previous quarter, the same as preliminary data released in October. While this marked a rebound from the 0.2 percent contraction in the second quarter, the growth rate fell short of the central bank's earlier forecast in August of 0.5 percent.
The country's GDP has seen fluctuations this year, with a 1.3% increase in the first quarter of the year, followed by the biggest decline seen since 2022. This comes as exports fell by 0.2% on quarter, spurred by a decline particularly in non-IT products such as vehicles and chemical goods. While this is 0.2 percentage points higher than the BOK's preliminary data, it's the first time since the fourth quarter of 2022 that exports have fallen quarter on quarter. That includes sluggish auto exports with the central bank explaining the decline. We mentioned strikes as a reason for stunted auto exports, and although strike actions stopped in October and November, strikes at auto parts companies as well as factory fires are contributing to continued slow growth. Experts say that geopolitical risks as well as underlying structural issues are driving the slowdown in economic growth. And even if we did not have the current difficulties, Korea's growth rate would be falling because of fall, uh, demographic problems as well as reduction in productivity and efficiency. But the current global circumstances, uh, especially President Trump's threat of a trade war is further lowering Korea's growth rate. On a positive note, facility investment surged 6.5 percent, driven by investments in semiconductor manufacturing equipment and transportation equipment, including aircraft. Private spending, which had been a cause for concern, saw a 0.5 percent increase, with increases for electricity, gas and vehicles, as well as in services such as medical care and transportation. With stunted economic growth in the third quarter, the Bank of Korea revised its economic growth projections down for this year and next year in November, from 2.4% to 2.2% for 2024 and from 2.1% 2 to 1.9% in 2025. Moon Hyeryeon, Arirang News. Railway workers here are on strike starting today, that is Thursday. Workers of the Korea Railroad Corporation launched a walkout after talks with management over wage hikes and workforce expansion broke down on Wednesday. The walkout is expected to affect the operation of subway services in the capital area, as well as high-speed trains and regular train services nationwide. Corail has said a 24-hour task force will seek to minimize disruptions. Most passenger trains are expected to run as scheduled, but cargo trains are likely to bear the brunt of the strike, with only some 20 percent of these trains expected to run. Striking workers have shared intentions to resume talks should the management shift its stance. Leaving behind a stable job and security to pursue a passion for online games is no easy task, but some game developers have chosen to do just that. Our Ian Jin covers their endeavors. This is CEO Park Jin-man, who quit his stable job at a major conglomerate company and jumped into the game development industry at the age of 40. He started the job as a single developer and now runs a game developing company with five employees. The game that he's developed is called Metal Suits, a reinterpretation of the retro game Metal Slug, which dominated arcades in the 1990s. When I was young, my uncle ran an arcade. Since then, I've had this desire to create games like Mega Man and Metal Slug. In this 2D pixel art game, there are 13 different suits, each with distinct characteristics. And the suits allow for a variety of battles. The game is about to be launched, but I'm still scared. I dream of this going beyond just the Metal Suits game to be turned into a movie or animation. The game The Relic has an immersive storyline, and its dark fantasy atmosphere is its strength. The developer, game company founder Park in was a computer graphics artist in Hollywood. He says the reason he left a stable career was because he fell in love with the appeal of communion in games. I challenged myself because I thought I could convey the feeling and emotions that only videos could convey through a game. This game first catches the eye with its colorful graphics. Then the fun comes from targeting 80 types of bosses with dynamic movements. In one word, I would define indie games as a challenge. My goal is to make a company that enjoys the games we develop. New indie games are being developed by people with creative ideas and enough passion to leave stable jobs. 
Receiving great praise for its feature during the Busan G-Star game exhibition this year, these games will be ready to meet gamers next year. Lee Eun-jin, Arirang News. This is The World Now, bringing you the latest stories from around the globe. In France, following a vote of no confidence by opposition lawmakers in the National Assembly, Prime Minister Michel Barnier was ousted on Wednesday. This is the first time since 1962 that a French government has been toppled in this manner. The motion of no confidence backed by a combination of right-wing and left-wing lawmakers passed with 331 votes, surpassing the required 289. This comes less than three months since Barnier, the European Union's former Brexit negotiator, was appointed the position. The vote was prompted by opposition to Barnier's proposed 2025 budget, which aimed to implement 60 billion euros in tax increases and spending cuts to address France's deficit projected to reach 6 percent of GDP this year. President Emmanuel Macron now faces the challenge of appointing a new prime minister to manage the deeply divided parliament and address the massive budget deficit. In Syria, the United Nations say that renewed hostilities have displaced approximately 115,000 people in just one week. UN Deputy Regional Humanitarian Coordinator for the Syria Crisis, David Cardin, emphasized the devastating impact on civilians during a visit to an internal displacement camp on Wednesday. The conflict has resulted in at least 70 deaths, including 27 children, and injuries to 338 people. Critical infrastructure has also suffered extensive damage, with 43 health facilities and 24 schools affected. Speaking from Aldana, Syria, Cardin highlighted the airstrikes and shelling in Idlib city as a major cause of the displacement. Rebel forces, including the extremist HTS group and the Turkish-backed Syrian National Army, have launched significant offensives against Syrian government troops, retaking territory in Idlib province. While eight efforts are underway, the humanitarian crisis continues to worsen as the conflict intensifies. On Wednesday, U.S. stock markets reached record highs following comments from Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. The Dow Jones Industrial Average surpassed 45,000 points, closing at 45,014.44, a 0.69 percent increase. The S&P 500 rose 0.6 percent to 6,086.47, and the Nasdaq Composite climbed 1.3 percent to 19,735.12. At the New York Times Dealbook Summit on Wednesday local time, Powell noted that the U.S. economy is in remarkably good shape, suggesting the Fed can afford to be a little more cautious in its approach to interest rate cuts. This bolstered investor confidence, leading to significant gains in technology stocks. In particular, Salesforce shares jumped 11 percent after exceeding revenue expectations and raising its annual forecast, contributing to the tech sector's rally. In Paris, preparations are underway for the grand reopening of Notre Dame Cathedral on Saturday, December 7th. The event marks five years since a devastating fire destroyed the cathedral's spire and much of the roof structure. Security measures have been tightened with a perimeter around the cathedral and road closures near the Seine. The restrictions have forced small businesses around the area, such as booksellers and Christmas market vendors, to shut down temporarily. However, the reopening is being widely celebrated, and the ceremony will kick off with heads of state and celebrities attending to honor those who helped restore the monument. Choi Ji-hee, Arirang News. With clear skies, the air is freezing cold all over the country. It feels much colder than the actual readings because of the strong winds. From tonight, a cold spell will rush in and the weather will get even colder. The light rain and snow that started in Jeollabukdo province will gradually expand to other regions. Up to three centimeters of snow will accumulate in the mountainous areas of Jeju Island by tomorrow morning. Central parts of the country, the Chungcheongdo provinces, Gangwondo province and Jeollabukdo province will have about five millimeters of rain or about one centimeter of snow. At one point tonight, light rain or snow is expected in Seoul. Tomorrow morning, Seoul will start below 0 at minus 2 degrees Celsius, Daejeon minus 1. Highs will move up to 4 degrees in Seoul and Chuncheon, Daegu and Gyeongju, 8 degrees. On Sunday, the morning temperature in Seoul will drop to minus 4 degrees. 
That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world. Those are the headlines at this hour. Thank you for watching.